Many people thought Klaus Bruinsma was an easy target because of his young appearance and wealthy background. However, he proved to be a cruel and frightening drug lord. Bruinsma had a huge and complex empire that reached across continents, all centered around one product, hashish. The numbers were huge, a multi-million dollar operation that made Bruinsma incredibly wealthy, amassing 500 million guilders. He earned millions of dollars each week from drug sales, but such wealth came with risks and dangers. Bruinsma was both a visionary and a target, understanding the price of power and the instability of the throne he sat on. He navigated a world where alliances were uncertain and loyalty could be bought. Law enforcement agencies across Europe relentlessly pursued justice to dismantle Bruinsma's network. However, his influence was widespread, showcasing the extent of his operations and his ambitious reach. Klaus Bruinsma's life is like a page from a crime thriller, a story of ambition, power, and the inevitable downfall. But his legacy is more than just a tale. It serves as a reminder of the constant shadow the underworld casts on society. This is not just a history lesson. It's a journey into the dark heart that lies beneath the pursuit of power. On October 6th, 1953, Klaus Bruinsma was born into a family of wealth in a high-class neighborhood, destined to inherit his father's thriving enterprise, Rock, the largest soda company in the Netherlands. Despite the luxury surrounding him, Klaus experienced a turbulent relationship with his father, marked by a series of demeaning exercises that planted the seeds of mistrust in his young mind. He had deep-seated anger and hatred towards his father, fueled by constant belittlement, it was described how Klaus's father would make him jump from a cupboard, catching him three times, only to let him fall on the fourth occasion, instilling a harsh lesson about trust. His father's lessons shaped Klaus into a rebel, with a burning desire to surpass his father in wealth, power, and influence. Klaus, also known as the Tall One, confided in acquaintances about his aspiration to surpass his father in wealth and power at a young age. Klaus's profound lack of trust in his father set the stage for a rebellious adolescence. As a teenage rebel, he turned to drugs, selling hash at school, and when expelled, he found an ideal opportunity for a more significant fortune in Amsterdam's rapidly growing drug trade. In the early 1970s, Amsterdam stood as Europe's dope capital, a hub of drug activity with iconic coffee shops transforming into distribution centers. Klaas seized this moment, establishing his presence in the city's red light district, the Zdijk, a shady world of prostitutes and drugs that Bruinsma couldn't resist. His journey into this world began when he started selling hash at a bar called Popeye near Light Supply. That's how the business truly began. It wasn't about bringing in large quantities from other countries. Instead, they worked with small amounts, cutting it themselves and selling to customers. To advance his emerging career in crime, Klaus required a partner, someone possessing the street credibility he lacked. This was where Thea Moyar, a native of Amsterdam's red light district, came in. Thea Moyar, who was the daughter of a Dutch mobster and a Singaporean heroin smuggler, became a key figure in Bruinsma's criminal enterprise. She had a meeting with Klaus, which marked a turning point. The partnership between Bruinsma and Moyar blossomed, leading to the establishment of the Buggy, a coffee shop serving as a front for their hash business. In 1974, the enormity of the narcotics issue became evident as authorities made the largest drug bust in Dutch history, seizing nearly 2,000 kilos of hash. In the docks of Den Helder, the smuggling boat Lammy laid there, concealed in the fishing net, wrapped in plastic bags, were significant quantities of hash imported from Lebanon. The man responsible for the shipment was Fritz van der Verald, a longtime associate of Thea's underworld clan. At that time, Klaus and Thea were selling a lot of hash, so they needed more from a bigger supplier. And Fritz was just right for the job. Uncle Fritz, as he was fondly called, an old hand at smuggling, used his connections to import hash from Lebanon. The operation thrived, with the diner owned by Thea's mother serving as a front for their illicit transactions. Fritz van der Werld, a 
a seasoned smuggler, became the link between Bruins Ma and international hash suppliers. Bruins Ma expanded his smuggling routes and developed connections with suppliers in Pakistan and Morocco. With low costs and direct connections to producers, Klaas took charge of the smuggling operations, dealing directly with suppliers in Pakistan and Morocco. Their smuggling boats transported exceptionally large amounts, ranging from 1,000 to 2,000 kilos of hash in each shipment. They were, in fact, the largest importers. With Queen Thea by his side, King Klaas is making a lot of money and embracing the lifestyle of a drug dealer. The booming hash business turned Bruinsma into a formidable force, organizing his criminal enterprise like a corporation. He had divisions for violence, narcotics, and money laundering, like a criminal corporation. He starts enjoying cocaine and spending time with expensive prostitutes. However, Thea is always there to keep him in line. The duo now shares a strong bond. Bruinsma had a protective nature towards Thea, and they were like brothers and sisters. Thea Moiar was married to Hugo Farrell, a gangster with a drug addiction. When Farrell's drug habit reached a crisis point, he attacked Thea with a wild look in his eyes. The situation escalated to the extent that he fired a gun at her, narrowly missing Thea's head. Following Farrell's departure, Thea seized the opportunity to escape from the house. Klaas, driven by fury, decided to take drastic action. He ordered Marianovich and one of his bodyguards, kickboxing champion Andrei Brilleman, to kill Farrell. In February 1982, Marianovich and Brilleman planted a bomb at Farrell's home. He survived the attack heavily injured. Klaas went mental, of course, because it all went wrong. In his anger, Bruinsma refused to pay the failed assassins, a decision that will come back to haunt him. Bruinsma then ordered Marianovich and Brilleman to make yet another attempt on Farrell's life. However, Brilleman and Marianovich made a deal with Farrell. They gave Klaas pictures showing Hugo on the floor, tied up with some sort of blood, which later turned out to be ketchup. They made a deal with Hugo to leave town for some time. After two weeks or a month, he found out that Hugo was alive and back in town. He verified it, and it turned out to be true. Bruinsma realized he had been deceived, and he was really angry. Then yes, he had a conflict with Brilliman and the Yugoslavian. In July 1982, desperate not to lose respect, Klaas ordered an attack on one of the responsible henchmen, Marianovich. The bodyguard, Brilliman, got a temporary reprieve from execution. The police started realizing that Bruinsma was a serious criminal with an international network. The violence associated with his activities was disturbing. It became clear that Klaas Bruinsma was not just a local nuisance, but a global player in the criminal underworld. Klaas got a call from an ex-boyfriend of Thea, Pietje Pieterse, who was refusing to hand over some of their hash. Unusually, Klaas visited Pieterse's house without bodyguards. Klaas would always place his gun on the table in front of him. Pieterse declared, I have stolen the stash. Pieterse had backup in case things went wrong. Upon hearing the shot, Leo Franson, and two other guys rushed to the scene. Klaas shot and hit Leo Franson, resulting in Leo's death. The gun feat established Klaas's reputation, but it came at a cost as he was shot several times in the stomach. The cleaning lady later described it as a mess, having to scrape pieces of flesh off the wall. It resembled a crazy war zone. Thea's gangster connections landed Klaas in the hospital and under threat of arrest. Feeling awful, Thea visited him in the hospital after the shootout, expressing guilt. Once again, the situation revolved around one of her boyfriends. The second time, she was willing to do anything to help him. With Klaas facing a long prison sentence for murder, Thea devised a plan to save her partner. She aimed to prove that Klaas was set up and acted in self-defense. Thea approached Peter Say with a tape recorder wanting to know what happened. After recording everything, she went to a notary who transcribed it all. Thea's recordings helped prove Klaas's self-defense claim. On January 31st, 1984, he was convicted of manslaughter, not murder, serving only two years in jail. Despite his imprisonment, 
Bruinsma's bloodlust continued behind bars. In 1987, with Bruinsma out of jail, violence escalated. Agent Slort pushed for authorities to bring Bruinsma down, leading to the establishment of a special task force, headed by Gert Van Beek. The task force started monitoring Bruinsma's every move and tapping his phones. However, Klaas, always one step ahead, had paid moles within the task force providing him with inside information. Feeling that the violence had become too much, Thea decided to leave. Without his partner, Klaas found himself alone, losing his grip on reality. After his release, by 1990, Klaas Brunsma reached the peak of his power as the biggest drug lord in Europe, worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Despite his immense wealth, he remained unsatisfied, constantly discussing the mother of all deals. In his vision, if successful, he would never have to work again and could sail around the world on a boat. True to his word, Klaas orchestrated the largest hash deal ever, involving Pakistani hash with a street value of half a billion guilders. This audacious plan was unprecedented, attempting to move such a massive amount of product in a single shipment. Investing millions of dollars in the deal, Klaas and his associates loaded 45 tons of hash into an open container in a Pakistani port, setting the ship on course for Europe. During the 10-month journey, the hash changed ships multiple times. However, on February 24, 1990, the Dutch authorities discovered and confiscated the entire 45 tons in a storage unit in Leuston. Although Klaas escaped, he suffered a massive financial blow, losing his quarter of a billion dollar profit and any chance of a pension. Fueled by anger and disappointment, Klaas turned to taking industrial amounts of cocaine, intensifying his vicious temper. The last two years saw him descend rapidly, becoming paranoid and suspicious due to his drug and alcohol abuse, leading to insomnia and a lack of trust in others. Stories around town revealed Klaus snorting cocaine, engaging with prostitutes, wasting money and driving expensive cars. His violent tendencies, such as cutting a prostitute's face with the back of his gun, made him a liability. Associates even considered getting rid of him themselves. In the early morning of June 27, 1991, at the Hilton nightclub, Klaus was high on drugs. There's another criminal, Martin Hoogland, who used to be a policeman but got kicked out for being too corrupt. He became a hitman. Both were high on drugs and got into a fight at the Hilton disco. Martin shot Klaus two or three times in the chest, so he fell to the ground. After that, he walked around him and then shot him once in the head. As we close this chapter, this story reveals that even the most powerful figures are not immune to the consequences of their actions. The tale of Bruinsma serves as a cautionary story, revealing the destructive nature of a life immersed in crime and corruption. If you enjoyed this story, make sure you like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. We'll be back with more fascinating stories from the world of crime. Until then, stay curious and stay safe.